Okay, so uh, a, a very warm and supportive welcome to Connell Tui, who is going to be talking about Oceana. I don't know whether you pronounce the dot or not digital. Um, all right, let's do that. Oceana dot digital um, using Digital New Zealand and Trove in the linked open data context. I think so. We're good to go. Okay, I'll just move this presentation over there and. Okay. That's not what I want to say. Okay, so you're going to see two slides at once. Um, so this way you get to see what's coming up and reduces the element of surprise slightly, but that's okay. Okay. When the first long, clear whistling notes of the Pipi Whara the shining cuckoo, were heard in the groves in the spring of the year, the Māori said to each other, listen, the messenger of summer, the bird of Hawaii, cries, koia, koia, dig away. Tis time to plant the kumara. This was in the month of October or early in November, when the little shining cuckoo landed on these shores after its long flight from the South Sea Isles. Okay. Next, okay. So when the people heard that the owner of a cultivation was going to plant largely in kumara, say three or four acres, they would come in a body to help him with his planting. Twenty or thirty or perhaps forty men would come to core the ground and with them a number of women and children to plant the seed tubers and to look on. The core was about seven feet long, sharp at the digging end, with a step or rest for the foot, about a foot from the point. When the people gathered at the mara, the cultivation plot, the priest karakiered the field chanting his incantations to Maru and the gods of the Kumara. Then the headman of the visitors, taking his stand in one of the corners of the Mara, cried in a loud chanting voice, Tēnei au e tūnei, me taku kō i tōku ringa, kei whea te tangata nāra te Mara, haere mai nei, here I stand, my kō in my hand, where is the man who owns this cultivation? Let him come here. Then approached the owner of the field and he showed the digging party where he wished them to work. So these extracts from James Cowan's book, The Māori Yesterday and Today, are for me a metaphor for the challenge we face in realising value from our digital collections. The collecting institutions are the owners of these fields. They must rely on the work of others to bring those digital resources, little fragments of sweet potato, to life and to realise their full value. As a technologist, I see the challenge for me is to champion technologies that can enable that kind of wide collaboration. Tools which our visitors can use and our, our partners can use to chip in and do their bit to grow our shared cultural heritage. What is the equivalent of the core for cultural heritage technology in the 21st century and collaboration? So me, about me, I'm an independent software developer um, and IT consultant. I'm originally from New Zealand. Um, but I'm now based in Brisbane, Australia. And for work, I help digital humanities researchers and people in the cultural heritage sector unlocking value from their collections, um, metadata, transcriptions, and so on. I help to make those collections fit for new purposes by automating conversion and enhancement, data mining, analysis, visualisation. I've been doing this kind of work for about 15 years. Um, and I see myself as this uh, person with the core in their hand. For me, this is my computer. Um, and the work that I try to do is to bring that, uh, that metadata to life um, and allow other people to, to contribute to it and to weave it into a much larger uh, and greater whole that we can all appreciate in our, own, in our own way. So apart from my work for paying clients, I have a personal project which is called Oceania Digital. And this is what um, I'm presenting about today. So onto the next slide. This is partly as a vehicle for me to explore technical challenges and to try out ideas, a kind of a sandbox, if you like, for my own work, um, uh, to learn and to play with technologies that are new, um, and as a kind of a testing ground. But it's also, and, and I hope 
increasingly, um, I hope to offer it as a kind of a public service um, that people can use, a real production service that will offer people some real value and to which they can contribute. Um, so that's where I'm going with, with Oceania Digital. Um, and so although it's really me, I have some other people who are interested in it. If anyone else is interested in contributing to it in any way, I'd be really grateful um, if you would talk to me about it um, because I certainly don't want it to be you know, my personal hobby. It's really something um, that I hope to interest the community in more broadly. So my method with Oceania Digital, my, my core, is uh, linked data as an enabling technology for this, uh, this kind of collaboration. The linked data buzzword, uh, also known uh, under its other names, Resource Description Framework, or RDF, um, also known as the Semantic Web, um, is at its core, it's a technology for organising knowledge in the form of a network, uh, an interlinked network, um, or a graph, as mathematicians would call it, a graph. Um, but not a graph in the form of uh, you know, a bar chart or something, but a graph in the sense of a network of nodes connected together by lines. Uh, and so this, this, uh, this technology um, of representing knowledge in the form of a network, um, let me keep moving along, of representing knowledge in the form of a network, as opposed to traditional forms of organisations which tended to focus on individual information resources more in isolation, um, and describe each one with a richly structured document of metadata record about some resource. Um, but by contrast, the semantic web approach um, treats those individual resources as, as nodes and it describes the relationships that they have with other nodes um, by, by connecting lines or, or, or properties or predicates, as they're sometimes called. So there are pros and cons to each of, the, each of those approaches, you know, the traditional approach and the, the semantic web approach. Um, but what I hope to explain today, and um, the point I'm trying to make here, is to explain why the balance is tilting gradually towards using um, semantic networks, um, because the continuing, continuing exponential growth in actual um, digital collections um, makes the advantages of that network-based data structure um, increasingly valuable. Um, and so I think over time, I would expect these kinds of technologies um, to eat into of those practices and to become more, more generally practiced in the, in the cultural heritage sphere. Um, and for instance, Jonathan's um, um, talk just, just prior to this um, using, um, using this Fedora-based um, application um, is an example of people using you know, linked open data as, a, as an actual technology in their application. You know, the Fedora, the Islandora application is a, a linked data store. So why do I say that collaboration with the public is so essential. Um, and I will tell you it's because no collecting institution can tell the full story about their own collection. The curators of these collections can of course tell a story about their collection, but that's necessarily a partial story. It cannot, cannot possibly be the full story. They can't tell the full story. What would a full story even be? Because it would mean being able to describe how the items in the collection uh, relate to the lives of the people uh, who are say depicted or described in those items. Um, or for whom those information resources were produced or wh who produced them, um, but it would also mean describing how those resources, those historical resources, relate to people today. How do people feel about them now? How do they, what do they mean to us today? All of those things, uh, all of those relationships, uh, are really what brings you know, meaning to those, to those items. And so there can't possibly be a full story. Every story is only one story, um, for each one of those items. So if you look, for instance, at, let's say, a historical photo, that photo is a witness to the life of everyone who's pictured in that photo. Uh, it's, it's a witness to the fashion and the hairstyles of, the, of that day. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also a, a witness to the state of the art in photography. Um, the photographic techniques, the photographic technology that was used to generate those things, those are all stories of various kinds, different kinds of stories that can be told about that item. And if you like, that item can be woven into a number of different threads that, cross, that cut across it in various different ways. And this is why it's important to have a technology which enables those, um, those different stories to be told and for an individual item to belong not just to one metadata record, but to be part of a, of a multiplicity of stories. Because of the, 
the, the multiplicity of connections um, between those items and the historical context that they were in and that they will be in in the future. Okay. So the challenge for memory institutions is to, is to make public what they, what they do know, the data that they do have, um, but to do so in a manner which makes it easy to combine with the knowledge of other people. And to, to make best use of that, of that broader context that the rest of society can bring to it, that, that, that bloggers uh, and that commentators uh, and that the, the, the staff of other cultural heritage institutions can bring um, to enrich the collections um, that, that are published by one institution. So the answer for these collecting institutions is to publish their knowledge not as large blocks of data, but as far as possible to publish it as a network to break those blocks of data up into individual threads, each of them quite small and very simple in structure and regular in structure, and then to weave those threads together. And the, the point of these threads is connecting two points, is that someone else can, can add another thread, connect to that point. Someone else can add another thread and connect to that point, and so on. And so together we can build a, a, a collaborative um, embroidery of knowledge. So to put it another way, the practical reason that linked data is so important is that it's an enabling technology for storytelling. Because each of these items provides you know, factual evidence for, for the stories that it participates in, um, but those stories also then provide a context in which those items can actually be understood. Uh, they, they, the context actually then brings meaning to those items. Um, and, and linked data's key advantage is in how it makes it easy to weave those items into a multiplicity of stories. And so to me, this is the reason why in the future, as our collections grow, and as we have to rely more and more on the public, and less and less being able to rely exclusively on the, on the uh, skills and, and, and knowledge of you know, collecting institution staff, we have to be able to base this, this um, information, these knowledge uh, structures on on a, on a format which, which can be interwoven and which is open to being, to being interconnected. So, I'm about halfway through, which is great, um, because now at this point I'm going to switch to my browser and show you a couple of browser tabs. Uh, if I can just be with me just a second. And I'm going to tell you a bit about where I'm, where I'm up to, just quickly, um, and some of the challenges, a few of the challenges that I've faced. And hopefully then, if people have got any questions, I'm happy to have you sing them out right now. Um, oh. Sorry about that. OK, so this is the, the website of my Oceania Digital. There's not a lot to see at the moment. Um, that's because it's taken me a bit longer than I thought to actually get to a point where you were something useful. Um, perhaps if you are interested in it, the one thing I'd recommend doing is following this account, Oceania Digital, on Twitter, um, because that's where, uh, as everything new is introduced, it'll be, it'll be mentioned there first. Um, or you can contact me by clicking on that contact link too. Um, so this, um, this data store, Oceania Digital. It's a website that's running on a virtual machine in the Amazon cloud in the Sydney data centre of Amazon. Um, and what it contains is several million um, uh, metadata records which I've harvested from Digital New Zealand and from the Australian equivalent, Trove. Um, and I also have some metadata records which I acquired from the Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, so I have these three data sources to begin with. Um, and I want to you know, bring together whatever else I can. But starting with those three, um, it seemed to me like a good place to go because um, they have already a very broad coverage. Um, and really it's a question of taking all the data from the APIs of those two services, harvesting it, converting it into RDF, and storing it in my RDF store. Um, and then everything's built on top of that. So. What I have, as I said, what I've managed to do so far, um, there are basically four phases to it. Um, so I'll quickly just go through those. First off is acquiring the data, um, and that has been relatively easy and also very hard. 
Um, the easiest has been getting the data from the Alexander Turnbull Library, the two large data files which I simply downloaded. Couldn't have been easier. Okay, the second one was um, uh, Digital New Zealand. Now you can't just download Digital New Zealand's data, sadly. Um, instead that they do provide an API which allows you to query it and retrieve, um, but basically to search it in fact, and I searched for, other words, everything, give me everything. I searched for space, I think. Um, what I got back then was about three million records. Um, and you can get, um, you can, when, you, when, you get, when you send a query, you get back 100 records, you can then query for the next 100 and so on. So it was about, um, about what is that, 30,000 um, queries, um, and I got back um, all those records which I've saved and then converted to RDF and stored in my triple store. So then what you see here is, these are a list of the various properties that were used in those records. You can see everything's got a, an identifier and a title. If you scroll down to the bottom of the list, these are some properties that are relatively rare. Um, not many metadata records have holdings or alternate titles and so on. But this is still part, as you can see, this is still where I'm up to, analysing the data that I've got, what have I actually got, and looking for the connections that I can make within that data set. Um, Trove was much more difficult. Trove's API was a lot less reliable than Digital New Zealand's and I spent weeks actually going backwards and forwards um, and working my way through various technical problems and actually getting the data out. So that was phase one, getting the data. Phase two is to convert it to RDF and as you can see this is, this is a summary really of the data that I have converted. Um, uh, then thirdly is to find the connections between those, those different records because there are a lot of connections there that are not made explicit in their data set, but which are really there, and I can actually find them by looking for things that match, names of people that match, other names of people in other parts of the collection, and actually build those, those relationships and build a network that way. Um, and the final thing then is to, is to connect the system up um, so that there are user interfaces, you know, search engines and um, browser plugins or what have you that will enable people to actually get some real value out of this knowledge network. Um, and what I have here, which I will quickly show you um, before I'm completely out of time, um, is one of these ones here. Okay, so this is the this is the Auckland Museum site. Now, this this page on the Auckland Museum site has a metadata record which they contributed to Digital NZ. I've harvested that and I've converted it to RDF and into into Oceania. Um, and if you scroll down, this is not the most exciting demo, but it's really a very small thing. And it's, the idea is to make it clear what's going on, rather than to knock your socks off. Um, but if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see these are other links, which this is a picture of a core, and they've got links to other core on other websites. And if you hover over this, you can see a little tool tip pop up with that label. Now that label was added, this is not part of their website, this is something that my browser plugin has added here. Okay? What's happening is that when this page loads, um, I have a piece of JavaScript embedded in the Auckland Museum website which goes and queries, it looks through all the links on the current page, and then it queries Oceania Digital, what do you know about this link, about that link, etc. And it brings back all the metadata that it knows about those pages, including descriptions, which are the same descriptions that uh, Poke Ariki, for instance, has contributed to Digital NZ. So that's it for me. I have basically run through the, um, where I'm up to, and I'm happy to take any questions. If anyone's got any technical or tricky questions, then you might want to leave them to later. No, no, by all means. So if you've got a question, then um, please put your hand up and we'll bring you a microphone. Stuart. Um, are there any collections that are in both Trove and Digital New Zealand? You'd think there'd be a lot of Australasian things that would be in both. Um, well, that's an interesting question, and um, I expect that there probably are. I mean, I know for sure that there are plenty of people who are present in both, and, and that goes right back to the early days of colonial settlement, um, that there were people who went backwards and forwards across the Tasman, and as trans-Tasmanian myself, you know, that's, that's nothing new. Um, and so I would certainly expect that, that, that I would find plenty of links between the two collections. If you're talking about individual items that might be in both, I think, yes, quite likely. I haven't found any yet, but that's really because of the hold-up I've had with Trove's data, and, and I hope soon to have Trove's data in there as well and be able to be making some of those collections connections. Nikolai. Oh, kia ora, Connell. Thank you. I'm interested in the Alexander Turnbull library data sets. Uh, there are two, one for the unpublished collections to the encoded archival description standard and one to the um, people 
um, encoded archival contents. So I'm particularly interested in whether your tools will help to uh, disambiguate or, or pull together the same individual who may be in the, in the different um, data sets you've got. How, how far have you got with that sort of work? Uh, well, uh, early days, let's say, early days. Um, but yes, I appreciate the question, it's a good question. Um, and I hope in general that this kind of um, approach, the, the knowledge network as a, as a technology, um, will really help with that disambiguation work, authority work, because um, it provides you with a way to link things up, people, let's say a person, um, to link them up with a whole lot of information about them, which might be biographical, might be pictures of them, etc., and to provide you with a whole lot of context that, that could be used by either by a human or by some kind of algorithm for doing those kinds of, you know, to support that kind of matching with, you know, with some reliability. Connell, I was just wondering if you could uh, give us a peek at the, um, the source for that page, the headers in particular. I was, I'm really curious what I'd like to see the, the technique that you were talking about there. Um, sure, I can show you the source. The source of this page, I should say, this page is actually the Auckland Museum page and I haven't changed it. Oh, um, okay. okay, so oh, it's cool. their HTML. You won't see anything in their HTML. What's actually running here, this JavaScript, is this browser plugin. If I open it, this is it. Kai Whakateri, which is Māori for Navigator. This is, oh, turn it on. Uh, if I open up the dashboard. So this is a bit of JavaScript that I've plugged in by embedding it in my browser. Okay, But it certainly could be attached to their website. And I would hope that in future people who you know, have collection websites would use this kind of JavaScript to enhance their site you know, and to add extra value to it and allow, allow their site to benefit from um, the, the web of knowledge that surrounds it. Um, but basically... What have I got here? Go our way. I don't want to know. Go away. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so, but if you have a look, uh, there it is there. So this is the JavaScript code. I'll just quickly scroll through it just to give you a, an idea of the scope of it. It's not very big. That's it. So basically what it's doing is it searches through the current page. It generates a Sparkle query which says, what do you know about these links? And it sends that off and it gets back some results and it goes through the page and attaches those descriptions to the various links as, as the title, the pop-up <laughs> attribute. But, I mean, ideally what I would like to do next is to have not just setting the title but to add you know, thumbnail images and to have pop-ups that really have a lot more information because there's a lot more information in there in, you know, in, um, in the data um, and all I'm using is, is the description at the moment. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and, oh, sorry. Is there time? Uh, if it's a quick question, yes. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I, can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't guarantee that. Um, <laughs> uh, I, it's really interesting that you've gone with the, um, uh, the user script kind of approach to this. Do you mm. see this as being something where the user might sort of select from particular data sources? So rather than having a, you know, everyone gets the same data, you can sort of, kind of customise what you're, what you're getting in some respects? Yes, I do. And I think, I mean, at the moment, the data that's currently in the Oceania Digital Data Store um, is all data that's come out of, um, out of the, the, the cultural heritage aggregators. But what I imagine over time is that other data would be available through it, you know, from, from uh, let's say, from DBpedia, from Wikipedia, um, and perhaps from other, you know, from Quake studies and so on, annotations that other people had contributed. And that's where it might start to grow to become kind of unmanageable. You'd have a whole lot of extra data and you'd, you know, you'd need some way to kind of filter it and perhaps you'd want to f follow certain people and say, yeah, I'm interested in what so-and-so says or, you know, I'm interested in certain user groups, you know, community, um, communities who would contribute something. Yeah, and I think uh, it, would be a, it would be a management problem, but it would be a great problem to have, I think. I'm sure there'll be many conversations that continue over the course of the conference. Um, so thank you very much and thank you for your grace under pressure with our, our technical um, fiddliness. Um, so if you're up for unexpected connections, reimagining the 19th century through generative art, then stay in this room, otherwise um, move on to your next session.